Good morning, everyone. This morning's prelude was chosen in celebration of International Women's Day, which is tomorrow, March the 8th. I have fond memories way, way back in the 70s when this song came on the radio and my mom and my sisters and I would all belt it out together. So, of course, feel free to sing along. Thank you, Leah. Wonderful song to celebrate International Women's Day. You know, it reminds me of my gran, who was a suffragette in London and marched in the streets of London for the right for women to vote. Makes me think we've come a long, long way since then. And today we see that we're still, there are still people marching in the streets for equality and our faith, our small but worldwide faith reminds us that every single person is equal. Every person deserves respect and every person is worthy. Our opening words this morning 
were adapted from Hearts Have No Borders by Marta Valentine. We come together this morning to honour the universal community of seekers to which we all belong. We gather together to share from our deepest place of safety that we might nurture ourselves by celebrating one another. We call into our presence this hour our ancestors whose love, labour and commitment made it possible for us to be here now. Let us call one another to the table of abundance that we may feed on those fruits that sustain us and ever ask us to grow. Let us open to this moment with hearts that have no borders. Come, let us honour and share and remember and invite and open to the mystery and the vision together. Our universalist heritage bids us light our chalice in the name of faith, in the light of hope, in actions of love. We gather in community to celebrate a heritage of faith, hope, and love. Our first song this morning is called As We Come Marching, Marching in our hymnal, but it's also known as the song Bread and Roses, a hymn setting of a poem by James Oppenheimer written in 1911. The expression Bread and Roses was first spoken by Rose Schneiderman, a Jewish Polish immigrant and labor union leader. Soon after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire one of the deadliest industrial disasters in U.S. history, which killed 146 workers, 123 of whom were women aged between 14 and 23. Addressing a crowd of mostly privileged women, Rose Schneiderman spoke these words. What the woman who labors wants is the right to live, not simply exist. The right to life as the rich woman has the right to life, and the sun, and music, and art. You have nothing that the humblest worker has not a right to have also. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses too. Thank you to Ruth for putting our words up on the screen. i 
So this is the story of Olympia Brown, the first woman minister of the Universalist Church and the first woman to be ordained with official approval from a national denomination in the United States. When the St. Lawrence faculty, the theological college from which she graduated, refused to ordain her, Brown appealed for equality to the Universalist Council. And to the surprise of many, they voted in her favor. This was 1863. Olympia Brown was also a social reformer and not much is made of the prejudice and opposition she faced when wanting to attend theological college, wanting to be ordained, being a woman minister, being a suffragist. But I think about it. Dear Olympia Brown, we here now try to imagine your struggle because nobody bothered to write that part of your story down. In this time, we understand that not just the victories are victories, but the not getting pulled under is a constant daily victory. Nobody wrote about that, but I bet your ankles were raw from all the pulling. And as I talk about you, maybe you don't recognize yourself in my words, but know that I made a place for you while I talk, made from all the things we wish we knew about you, but never will. Olympia was born in a one-room log cabin in Schoolcroft, Michigan, January 5th, 1835. She was the oldest of four children. Her uncle's house nearby was part of the Underground Railroad and she often traveled there to visit with people who'd escaped from slavery. And for seven years, one worked as a hired hand on her family farm. According to Olympia, her mother was a very zealous universalist who taught her about universal salvation and the importance of equality for all people. She attended Mary Lyons Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, the first college for women in the United States. She lasted a year. The weekly sermons about damnation, fire and brimstone were intolerable to her. She transferred to Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. It was one of the first colleges in the country to admit students of African descent on equal ground. Brown felt a call to universalist ministry, but no theological school admitted woman, women. She finally persuaded the president of St. Lawrence University to admit her in 1861. She wrote, Mr. Ebenezer Fisher, the president, replied that I would be admitted, but he did not think women were called to the ministry. Olympia Brown, ordained on appeal, June 25th, 1863. Ebenezer Fisher, president of the university, also an author, whose book makes no mention of Olympia Brown in the chapter, The Women of the Universalist Church. Fisher calls the woman ministry, new and unfamiliar. He wrote these words in 1905, over 40 years after Brown's ordination. Brown served the church in Weymouth Landing, Massachusetts, at the same time, she spent months in Kansas speaking on behalf of women's suffrage. In the words of one of her parishioners, when Reverend Miss Brown came among us, the society was in poor and unhealthy condition, but she went to work doing everything in her power for the advancement and best interests of the society. Olympia Brown, married 1873, K 
keeping her own name. In 1874, she decided to resign her ministry after over five years with Weymouth having young children. And she was later pastor of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And we know that congregation was reluctant to have a woman minister. But we don't get to learn much about that because the fullness of that story wouldn't really serve the narrative of anybody who was writing about it at the time. So it's gone. And that's not fair. Dear Olympia Brown, I want to let you know that I don't like the way some people who stood in your way later, later patted themselves on the back. I bet it feels similar to hearing when women were given the vote, because as you would say, women weren't given the vote, they took it. In 1878, she accepted a call to a church where she would serve as minister for nine years. The clerk of the Universalist Church in Racine, Wisconsin, wrote that the parish was in an unfortunate condition thanks to a series of pastors easygoing, unpractical, and some even spiritually unworthy, who had left the church adrift, in debt, hopeless. Brown accepted the challenge. She worked to rejuvenate the church and establish it as a center of learning and culture, a place to discuss the social issues, including suffrage. Under her ministry, the women began to vote and hold office in the church, and after nine years, Brown left a thriving congregation. Looking back on her career as a parish minister, Olympia Brown wrote, you must remember that the pulpits of all the prosperous churches were already occupied by men. All I could do was to take some place that had been abandoned by others and make something of it. And this I was only too glad to do. She left full-time ministry to become an activist for women's rights. It became her work for the next 32 years. The church in Racine is now called Olympia Brown. And I think she would absolutely love it. The elementary school in Racine is also named after her. And I think she'd really love that place too. I like to think of her as described by her daughter, Gwendolyn Willis. She called her mother troublesome. She said she asked people to do things, to work, to contribute money, to go to meetings, to think, to stand up for justice and equality. In the fall of 1920, Olympia Brown returned to the Racine Church. You may be familiar with the words she spoke. Stand by this faith, work for it and sacrifice for it. There's nothing in all the world so important as to be loyal to this faith, which is placed before us the loftiest ideals, which had comforted us in sorrow, strengthened us for noble duty and made the world beautiful. Earlier that same year, 1920, Brown, aged 85, took part in the last of the great suffrage demonstrations, the marching on the Republican convention in Chicago. It was two months later that women won the right to vote. Of the original suffragettes, only Olympia lived long enough to cast her vote. She was an outspoken universalist preacher, a fearless campaigner for equality and justice for the rest of her 91 years of life. She died in Baltimore, 23rd October, 1926. Thank you, Sybil, for that beautiful story about Olympia Brown. This is the first Sunday of our annual Pledge Drive, and I'd like to thank the Pledge Drive team for inviting me to speak very briefly about what our fellowship means to me. Marla Thorburn offered me my choice of Sundays, and I chose this one 
because it's the 12th anniversary of our moving to Vancouver Island and becoming brand new Canadian permanent residents. We came to the fellowship just a few days later, looking for a new spiritual home. We found not only our spiritual home, but also our community and the place where we belong. But how can I explain that? Thinking back to this morning's story, I'm reminded that because women like Olympia Brown paved the way, the career world was wide open and welcoming to girls of my generation. I had the great good fortune to earn a degree in chemical engineering and to work for many years as a process engineer in the oil industry. So I believe in chemistry. And I use the word chemistry as shorthand for when something emotionally and spiritually complex occurs. What makes two people fall in love? Chemistry. What made me feel we belonged at Fufon? What has deepened our commitment to the community through all its ups and downs, triumphs and challenges for the past 12 years? Chemistry. Chemistry is my word for those moments, small and unexpected, when this fellowship opens me up to the beauty and mystery of life. This is the miracle. This is the magic. I never know when it will happen. Like one time at spaghetti night back in 2017, the room was packed with people. My mother had died a few weeks or months earlier, I don't remember, and I didn't really have a proper cry over it. I was exhausted from caregiving, emotionally spent, and busy with all the stuff you have to do when someone dies. After all of us had feasted and cleared the dishes, Tony Turner played some of his songs, including one called Love Me As I Am. It's about growing old and deteriorating and putting your life in the hands of your adult child. You are now the strong one. Won't you love me as I am? Everything I had been trying to contain broke open. Tears were pouring down my face, and I thought, good thing everyone is watching Tony, including Bob, who had his back to me. And then Brian Hemingway tapped me on the shoulder and handed me his handkerchief, as soft and white and neatly folded as angel wings. What a moment. I'd like to borrow a line from an essay that Roger Ebert, the movie critic, wrote about the movie Moonstruck. He said, the movie makes you laugh, which is very difficult, but it also makes you feel more open to your better impulses, and that is harder still. Like that movie, the fellowship makes me laugh and cry and gives me moments of insight into the beauty and mystery of life which is very difficult. This fellowship opens my heart to its best impulses, and that is harder still. This is what I think about when I make my annual pledge. As you consider your pledge, I invite you to think about what this fellowship means to you.
we belong to a deep rooted faith. People are the roots, people like you and I, people who felt strongly about their society and about making it a better place. People who were open to new ideas, people of radical ideas, radical for their time and maybe still are. John Murray was such a man. He said he thought his irrepressible cheerfulness wouldn't suit a career in, in the church. In England, he was well thought of as a Methodist preacher. And then he was captured by a new and radical idea, a universalist message, a message that put all people on equal footing, a message that challenged the doom and gloom of endless suffering in this life and the life hereafter. Murray's irrepressible cheerfulness came to an end when he was tossed in debtor's prison. And then after his wife fell ill and the bills rose even higher. And then after his firstborn child got sick and died, and then soon followed the death of his wife. Neither religion nor human community provided any help, any solace to Murray. And deep in his grief and despair, he contemplated suicide. It was a chance encounter with a traveler from the New World, America, that offered him a way out in a new direction. He decided to give up on religion entirely and bury himself in the New World. In July of 1770, he boarded a boat called the Hand in Hand and sailed for New York. Three days out, the vessel ran aground at Barnate Bay in south of New York. In order to lighten the ship and free it from the shores, shoals, cargo was transferred to a sloop and Murray was put in charge. Stranded on that Jersey coast, Murray went ashore to get provisions. And there he ran into a local resident, Thomas Potter who was about to change Murray's life and launch a new religion in North America. Now Potter, he was a curious man, a deeply religious man and a passionate man for new ideas, especially this new idea called universalism. But Potter was also illiterate. So he had built a meeting house on his farm in the woods of Good Luck, New Jersey where he invited traveling preachers to share their ideas. Well, when he heard that Murray had come from where he had come from and that he had knowledge and experience of these new ideas, he begged him to come and share them. But Murray was resolute. He was completely done with religion and done with preaching and declined the invitation. Potter implored, and finally, got Murray to agree that if the wind did not rise to take his boat off the shoals by Sunday, he would come and preach this new and radical message. Well, we don't have many stories of miracles in our tradition, but this one I think certainly comes close. For day after day, the winds did not stir. And finally, Sunday came and Murray kept his promise. He came to the meeting house in the woods, built with optimism and vision, and preached the first universalist sermon in North America. That Sunday, he may have said something like this, though these are the words of Alfred S. Cole. You may possess only a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage and preach the everlasting love of God. And of course, as good stories go, shortly after Murray spoke that day, 
Up came the winds, loosening his boat from the sandbank, and he continued his journey. That July day, John Murray sowed the seeds of universalism in America, and the winds of time bring it to us today. It's kind of hard to imagine today just how radical that message was 250 years ago. It was truly revolutionary. No more roasting in the, pit, the fiery pits of hell. No more eternal damnation for sinful living. No more hell at all. The new message was God loves every person equally. Your behavior is no longer punished in the afterlife. And love others as God loves you. Be good for good's sake and not because you fear a punishing God. These ideas, they flew in the face of the established Western religions, the Catholic, the Protestant, and everyone in between. For those in the 1700s, and even for some today, that message is shocking. The churches were dependent on their followers, believing in God's punishment, his judgment, and that, su that this suffering could be avoided if you stayed in the church and followed their rules. And from an outsider's perspective, it seems an excellent way to control people with fear. And the Universalists were saying, there's nothing to fear. There's only love, universal love. So you can imagine the established church's response to this radical idea that undermined their authority, their power, their finances, their entire theological structure. Needless to say, Murray and those who followed him didn't have an easy time spreading the message of universal salvation. The doors of the meeting houses were barred to them, literally locked. They were thrown in jail. Everything in the established religion's power was done to undermine this message of love. Salvation's not a word that we use much anymore because our faith doesn't believe in hell or sin. There's nothing for us to be saved from. We might need saving from ourselves, but that's another topic. Even in Murray's day, the early Universalists said that hell was here on earth. It was the present condition in which some people lived. That poverty and, in and inequities brought about by lack of access to education and health care, these were hells from which people needed saving. Universalists moved by their theology of universal love stepped into the work of social justice as a natural outcome of their belief in universal salvation. They threw themselves into providing education to the rural poor. They established sec secular schools that were open to all, which meant at the time open to girls and women. In the universe, it was the Universalists who created opportunities for higher education for women and who ordained, as we heard earlier, the first woman in any denomination in North America. Olympia Brown, as we heard, was ordained in 1863. And it was the Association of Universalist Women that became the first continent-wide women's organization in 1870. Universalists were strong supporters for the separation between church and government. They worked in prison reform and for the end to capital punishment and expressed their deep concerns for sla against sa slavery. Universe moved up to Canada along the eastern coast and through the northern states into Ontario and Quebec. Halifax was where the first Universalist church was established in Canada in 1837. Universalism has grown and moved across the continent, 
But there were other forces that challenged it. There were internal struggles to form an institutional structure. The First World War decimated the rural populations from which most Universalists came from. And after the war, many never went back. They moved to the city. And the premise of Universalism, that radical message of universal salvation, it got absorbed into the mainline churches, which meant that the Universalist message was no longer so radical. In the mid 20th century, Universalists struggled to find an identity that met the spiritual needs of this modern world. Now, because the Universalists shared many similarities with the Unitarians, and after many years of dialogue and negotiations, in 1961, those two groups merged in the United States, which is why in that country, the organization is called the Unitarian Universalist Association. In Canada, some would say that we absorb the message, but not the name. There were only a couple of Universalist congregations functioning in Canada at the time. That same year, 1961, that formed the merger of the Universalists and the Unitarians south of the border, 11 Unitarian congregations organized themselves into the Canadian Unitarian Council. There is still grief and discussion today about how and why the Universalists lost their radical message. And there are lessons for us to learn. First off, a vision defines purpose. Their vision gave them purpose. A vision doesn't have to be fancy, but it does need to grab you. A vision is what we reach for, like the leaves in a tree reaching for the sky. A vision also roots into reality and gives you energy, vitality, and inspiration. A vision comes both from the head and from the heart. A vision is bigger than one person, but one person can hold the vision. A vision is aspirational. It may never be fully reached, but it is very well, well worth trying. If you think about it, universal love embraces everything. It means you're worthy of love, regardless of who you are and what you've done. It's not merit-based. You're worthy of love simply for breathing. And so is the next person beside you, as is your neighbor, yes, even the one who shouts at you or parties into the wee hours, as is the woman at the bus stop who pushes past you, as is the man curled in the corner of the building, hands swollen from cold. Each is equal in this vision of universal love. Included in this vision are the essential workers and the non-essential workers, those who can stay home and those who put on their masks and head out into the world, as are the managers and the owners of corporations, the money people and the politicians in this and every country. This theology of love, as you might be feeling, is challenging. You might be thinking, oh no, not so-and-so, not the cruel people not the greedy people. Universalism would say yes. They are worthy of love too. And there's no punishment waiting for them after death. When John Murray was talking about universalist love, he was just focused on the human race. But here in the 21st century, if we were to rebrand universalism today, we might include all living things of the earth and even perhaps beyond the planet. We could include every living thing in the entire universe. A different take 
on Universalist. A vision emerges when it's needed, when the times are ready. It comes out of conditions that do not support what we are capable of, what our imaginations and hearts yearn for. It comes out of a desire for a future that is radically different than our present. Today, we celebrate the vision of a handful of women uh, that a handful of women had a hundred years ago, maybe more than a handful. But it has surpassed the first goals of women's full participation in society. A society at that time that was predominantly white middle-class women and their equal participation, that vision has expanded now to include women from all classes, all cultures, and all countries, which is why we say the work on International Women's Day is not done. I think the vision of universalism has expanded too. Although it's integrated within the values of our society, settled even into the laws like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms here in Canada. Yet the vision of universal love, it's still needed. We aren't there yet. Our faith, our fellowship, it's not a social club where relationships are shallow and impermanent. We have deep roots reaching back hundreds of years. We stand on the shoulders of visionaries who inspire us still to live deeper lives, lives that aspire to change this world. And that's a vision worth having. As we prepare to pledge this year, I invite you, as Deborah did earlier, to reflect not only on the meaning that this fellowship has for you, but how it nurtures you and inspires you and how it comforts you. Reflect also on the deep roots of vision that others have had that feed us still today. Blessed be, thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah. Our next song is Wake Now My Senses, and thank you again to Ruth for putting our words up on the screen.
now you're all invited to switch to gallery view and imagine we're all in, in the hall together holding hands in a big circle and we'll sing our closing song, Carry the Flame of Peace and Love Until We Meet Again. Then we shall see a world of light and a world of joy. Can